Okay, now let's talk about the assessment of cardiovascular system. So, when you have a patient with the cardiovascular system uh, issues, you need to definitely look at their history and look at what is ever significant and correlates to the history of this patient. So, a common, comp a common complaint that brings patients to the hospital of chest pain, also short char shortness of breath. And you will find that cardiovascular and pulmonary they're always connected with each other. So when there's a problem with one, it you know you'll see manifestation of the other one, fatigue, tobacco use, and um, we talked about streptococcal infection that can uh, cause some uh, endocarditis for long term, uh, uh, congenital uh, stroke, palpitation, any symptoms, uh, the cardiovascular system, it must be documented, and see how it is connected to the current admission. Also, medication, and mainly cardiovascular medication, and other medication that affects the cardiovascular should be also um, collected. Now, when inspection, there are a few things, a few signs and symptoms that you must be um, able to know and interpret if you see it. So, we're going to start with the jugular vascular dis uh, distension, JVD. So, JVD, it's an indication that there's a high volume of venous return. So, that's why it could be high. A preload also the CVP which we say that this is a measurement of the preload will be there this could be not necessarily high volume coming back but it could be also congestion so if there's a congestion in the left side of the heart for example this congestion will back up and will affect the left side of the heart uh, sorry the right side of the heart so you can think of it as a traffic in the freeway and that's why you will see a JVD uh, so and that also could be a problem in the right side of the heart the heart failure that leads to congestion this also means that the pressure, because there's high volume in the right side of the heart, the pressure within the right side of the heart ventricle and will be high as well. Also can be an indication of high volume. Now, something to keep in mind when you do the, the assessment. Now, as you see, this is, um, this is a JVD in this patient. Now, something important you need to know is that JVD is not significant until uh, the patient is sitting up. So if you see it in supine, you need to bring your patient up to 45 degrees and that's if you still can see a JVD and then that's a significant JVD that's one okay the other thing is central cyanosis a central cyanosis this is a medical emergency now this is a cyanosis or bluish uh, color that you mainly see in the central area like in the tongue and in the uh, um, lips Okay, so whenever you see that it's a medical emergency because it's an indication of severe hypoxia the saturation is very low, usually it's below 80 or 85 percent. So when the patient gets there, um, then it's a medical emergency. This is something you will learn about also in the PEDS. In PEDS, when the deoxygenated and exogenated blood get mixed, and that can lead to central cyanosis. The other um, cyanosis that you can also see is the cyanosis, the peripheral cyanosis. So peripheral cyanosis, again, is something you'll see in the extremities, and you might find it in the nose. Okay, and again, it's an indication of low oxygen in the peripheral blood vessels. Another thing you may see, especially in patients with endocarditis, is um, the splinter, the hemorrhage splinter, as you see, can see in this picture here. This is being correlated with um, endocarditis. Okay. Also, you may see it in, in different patients that indicates a recent infection. Now, another serious uh, sign that you could see is it's the clapping of the nails, which, again, it's mainly, it's also known as a, a drumstick uh, fingers. This is really, uh, mainly had to do with, again, severe deficiency of oxygen or a prolonged deficiency of oxygen. Uh, of O2 as a result of that. So if you can see, this is a patient, this is how his uh, nails were at the time of admission before the oxygen therapy. And this is by the, after the, the treatment, they went back to, its nor to their normal shape. Uh, another thing is the uh, uh, ulcers, and there are two kind of ulcers. We have the venous ulcers and we have the arterial ulcers. And there's a little bit of difference, but in, in both cases, the problem here is that these ulcers, they, they don't heal as normally, and they take longer time. They may not even heal. And again, it's it's an indication of poor circulation. So the venous type, because of uh, it, you will see it in more of necrotic 
kind and where the uh, arterial it, it looks more of pale and you can just see in this picture the major difference something you see mainly in patient with again impaired uh, circulation in the lower extremities like in diabetic patient okay another symptoms is again the varicose veins now remember that the veins they um, they have valves and these valves they they should be healthy and they're they prevent the backup of the blood so when the blood starts to circulate back to the heart these valves will prevent the backup of them now in the patient with with the uh, diseased veins what happened the valve become loose so now there is more of accumulation of a blood around this area and this is the shape that you will see in the in patient with varicose veins okay now that's as far as inspection as far as palpation uh, the f it has to do mainly with the pulse and one of the thing uh, one of the changes in the pulse well, let's talk about bounding pulse basically and that's when the pulse is strong stronger than normal now this is not necessarily a good indication so the ca the common causes of that increase of the, uh, the demand the metabolism demand or increase of the thyroid which will increase the metabolism with no need for that. But in case of fever and anxiety, whenever the metabolism is up, then you will see that uh, there's a lot of uh, adrenaline, uh, adrenaline or epinephrine is coming, and that's kind of the fuel for the heart. So that's why the pulse becomes very strong in pounding pulse. Now, the other type is a 3D weak pulse. The 3D weak pulse uh, has to do mainly with, uh, again, either l l um, weak contraction or there's not enough um, fluid. Okay, so it could be, again, in case of heart failure, the heart is weak. So weak heart means the push will be weak and then the pulse that you will feel will be weak. Or could be hypovolemia problem where the venous return is low. So since the volume is low then the preload is low then the cardiac output will, will be low and then the effect of that cardiac output which is the pulse will also be weak the irregular pulsation we'll talk about the dysrhythmia next time but mainly it has to do with the uh, uh, conduction system it could be in any area we'll talk about it in details for next week as well as the uh, pulses alternas and which basically this pulse alternus it has nothing to do with the uh, the, the, the um, regularity of the pulse the pulse usually is regular as you see here it has to do with the strength so one time you find it strong and then you may find it also weak and this has to do with what's going on around the heart not necessarily within the heart so this is something you can see it in cardiac tamponade when you have when there's a fluid surrounding the heart and restrict restricting the movement of the heart this should uh, um, uh, remi remind you of a pleural effusion so when you have a pericardial effusion this is some this is one of the classical symptoms that you may see in this kind of patient so again this is a regular rhythm it's just the strength is not regular another thing that you learn in health assessment has to, is the thrill which is like a, a, a kind of vibration of the blood vessels and this is mainly had to do with aneurysm this can be a serious uh, a serious sign especially if the patient has thoracic aneurysm because this could rupture at any point also it could have to do with murmurs and when in case of aortic regurgitation now the absence of pulse is something very serious can be depends now there's some pulses are hard to feel and that's when you need to use a doppler but this has become very significant let's say for example this is a patient who had a clot uh, in uh, his uh, in the popliteal femoral artery so the patient had a surgery and now we have to do a bypass graft now the pulse now so the pulse before the surgery there was no pulse now there should be pulse this is after surgery is a very serious thing so if you assist the pulse here and you don't find it this is a medical emergency you have to refer you have to inform the physician now displace uh, the PMI as you know PMI normally it's the uh, mediclavicular, mediclavicular line with the uh, fifth intercostal space and that's where the epics are now in some cases when the heart become hypertrophic and the heart become lar larger bigger like in case of heart failure then the PMI you may feel it at the sixth intercostal space or the, instead of the fifth intercostal space that means that the heart is 
becoming larger, which is not necessarily a good thing again. We'll talk about that in heart failure. Now edema and pitting edema, we talked earlier about the um, imbalance in the pressure between the blood or the vessels or the serum or extracellular and between the uh, blood inside the cells, uh, sorry, the pressure inside the cells. And then so edema, it could be a cardiovascular problem, it could be also liver problem because again it depends on the albumin. Now the grading of, uh, of uh, you learn about the grading of edema, edema it goes from zero when there's no edema and then of course the more the more edema the, uh, the, the more um, time it takes to return to its normal shape and the deeper the number also. Okay. All right. Capillary, capillary refill, you're all familiar with that. It should be between two to three seconds. If it's more than three seconds, that's an indication of, again, a lack of perfusion in the peripheral. So normally two or three seconds should not be more than that. Now, if you assist a patient with cardiovascular problem and you find that their limb is not um, symmetric, you find, like in this case, this patient has a left, uh, sorry, a right DVD. <laughs> right DVT. And DVT will cause this inflammation, so you can see the difference between the right and the left. The last uh, technique is the aus auscultation. And in auscultation, First thing you can hear or after you assess the apical pulse, you, you may find a difference between the apical pulse and the radial pulse. So pulse deficit basically is the difference between apical and radial. This normally should be no difference, they should be exactly the same. But if you hear, let's say you, you find the apical pulse to be 90 and radial pulse to be 85, so the difference in this case, which is the pulse uh, deficit, is 5. Okay, this is something you commonly see it in irregular heart rate and uh, common in atrial fibrillation. Because in atrial fibrillation, you have more than area that's beating at the same time, but at the end, only the the only P that will create a QRS or contraction is the one that you will feel, in uh, as far as pulse. So that's why you may find more apical pulse than radial pulse. The brew is uh, again has to do with the uh, atrial obstruction or partial obstruction, and this is uh, you commonly see in, in patients with the uh, carotid. So let's see, let's hear how that will sound. Alright, and then as far as abnormal heart sound, we know that normally is uh, S1, S2, um, you may find S3 and S4, and these both, we call them the gallops, and for S3, it has mainly to do with the ventricles, that's why we call it the ventricle um, gallop, and basically, the, the, the problem here, this is extra sound, it has to do with overload, so when the ventricles are kind of struggling because of too much volume coming um, do you hear that and then the other one the s4 you hear it when the ventricles are resistant but now the atrial has to do has to apply more force to push the blood from the atria down to the ventricles so that's why we call it the atrial gallop and this is the sound of the um, s3 This is for S4. Okay. And cardiac murmur, we will talk about that in details and when we talk about the valve, but just an example. The last thing is a peripheral friction rubs, that's a pericardial friction rubs, which you will find it in a patient with pericardial effusion. Remember when you talk about the, pericar the uh, uh, pleural effusion, this is the same idea, an inflammation or collection of fluids around the pericardial sac, and then as far as the treatment is the same thing. We did what we call the uh, pleural synthesis or thorough synthesis for a patient with a pleural effusion, and we, and we do here what we call pericardial synthesis. 
Um, same idea, it's a little bit more serious because of the heart, but the same idea, it's basically aspirational fluids that surround the heart.